Uh, thank you all uh, for coming to our post-show discussion of The Winter's Tale. Um, my name is Daniel Siba. I am the education director here at Quintessence, and we have two uh, very uh, uh, distinguished Shakespearean scholars who are joining us. Um, I'll introduce them, and then we're each going to share just a brief, like, maybe five minutes if it goes that long, of sort of our own responses and, and sort of giving a little bit of some context that might be helpful for the piece, and also responses to the performance, and then we'll happily open it up to questions and comments from the group, um, and just sort of any, any, anything that people want to say. We're very happy to have you all here. Oh, uh, uh, Dr. Kazusko is a professor, of, a professor of English at Ursinus College, where he teaches Shakespeare and early modern drama. His principal research interest is in Shakespeare and questions of performance, theater history, and appropriation. He is the editor of The Two Gentlemen of Verona with the new, the new Kittred Shakespeare and two essay collections. His scholarship has appeared in Shakespeare Survey, Early Theater, Shakespeare Bulletin, and numerous collections and handbooks. He is the general general editor for Borrowers and Lenders, the Journal of Shakespeare and Appropriation, and series editor for Shakespeare and the Stage. When not at the library or on campus, he can generally be found surfing the fierce beach breaks down the Jersey Shore. <laughs> it, you gave me that bio. I read what I do. Uh, and our other guest today is uh, Paula Morantz Cohen, uh, who is a distinguished professor of English and dean of the Panani Honors College at Drexel University. She is the author of six novels and six nonfiction books, including most recently, Of Human Kindness, What Shakespeare Can Teach Us About Empathy, published by Yale University Press. Two of her novels, Much Ado About Jesse Kaplan and Beatrice Bunsen's Guide to Romeo and Juliet, make use of Shakespearean plot and characters. She is also the host of The Civil Discourse, a TV interview show broadcast on many PBS stations throughout the country. So please uh, join me in giving a hand to our <laughs> I'm gonna start us off just by briefly uh, talking about the thing that was standing out in my head as I've been watching uh, this production uh, a couple of times. And it's really a, a structural uh, consideration that I think is just helpful for us to note. Um, that famous stage direction Exuant pursued by a bear, um, which, which seems to be, uh, thank you. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a very striking moment of the play. And I was looking at one of the guides uh, to Shakespeare I have upstairs. I'm making our education guide for our, our high school matinees at the moment. Uh, hopefully I'll be done by Tuesday. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, uh, one of the things I noted is that stage direction actually falls exactly halfway through the play text. <laughs> Right? So what does that mean where like this notable moment of the production is actually like square center dividing the three acts that come before it and then the two acts that follow it. And again, with Shakespeare, we have this five act structure. And the other thing I noticed is I was thinking structurally, which is not something I often do <laughs> about plays and, and theater. But the other thing that was notable is that um, uh, there are line breakdowns for every act in, in, this, in this guide that I have. And the fourth act, which is the whole section in Bohemia with all of the shepherds, um, that starts our second act of the play, is the longest act that Shakespeare ever wrote for a play. Um, and so, and there are a lot of fourth acts that are really, really teeny, right? So, uh, and I have the numbers here. Uh, the Winter Tale Act 4 is uh, 1142 lines. In comparison, the Tempest Fourth Act is 280 lines, Romeo and Juliet is 407, and Twelfth Night is 222, right? So significantly expanded, right? So I think that's just really interesting uh, when we think about like this play being one of the last plays that Shakespeare wrote when he was sort of turning away from just like a play being a comedy or a play being a tragedy to this romance genre as it's sometimes categorized. And to really think about like this emphasis of this very, very long fourth act in which we're transported to Bohemia and that being a really, really important thing that is sort of given weight, you know? And you know, at Quintessence, 
Um, we, uh, we are, uh, the, 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 although every director makes their own decisions, we definitely are a text forward theater company. And so the cuts for this production in specific are minimal. So what does that mean to sort of think about like actually seeing the flow of the play? And I probably talked too long, and so I'll move forward to uh, just whatever thoughts you want to share about um, the production for us. Okay, I, I thought it was a wonderful production. Um, I guess I'll talk quickly about the first, the, the first scene and the last. The first I thought was very well done because it, actually we were just talking before that Dan felt, and I think Matt agrees that Leontes seems not to be, not to have a motive for his sudden jealousy. I disagree with that. I think that if you read the play closely and the way it was staged, showing the dancing that went on between the different characters, including the two men, that that notion of the, somehow <coughs> the loss, particularly of the male friendship in childhood, um, when the, the play starts with a competitive discussion of two men, servants, talking about hospitality and how, how competitive, in a sense, these two countries are. And I think the idea is, as boys, these two boys were like innocent lambs, without competition. They fell into, into competitiveness and into adulthood, so to speak, and into heterosexuality, I guess, and the love for their, 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 their queens. And as a result, this loss was a, was a kind of uh, a trauma for Leontes. And maybe that sounds too academic, but I really do think that the jealousy is directed both at Hermione and at Polixenes, that he was jealous of both, and that this, this welling up of of feeling that he, uh, uh, Polixenes had agreed to stay because his wife, who was extremely outgoing and flirtatious and so forth, um, was able to convince him was enough to tip him over the edge. And I guess the acting, you, have, you could quarrel with how sudden it seemed. It could be kept back and bottled up, or it could be a sudden switch that turns. Um, so I, I think that there was motive there. And then the other scene, which is so famous, is the statue scene, which really gave me a shiver of, of magic, magical delight when that statue came to life. I, I think the notion here is we can't explain it. And it's, it's, it's an indeterminate sort of thing. Is this, was she kept alive by Paulina? Were they engaged together in some sort of relationship for 16 years? or is it actually magic? I, I think the point is not to know, because the certainty that Leontes had at the beginning is that toxic certainty hmm. that we have to avoid, that we see in our society now. And it's that indeterminacy that we need to, we need to be able to feel comfortable with not knowing. And I, I really think that they work together. So I'll stop there. Oh, yeah. thank you. <coughs> Yeah, I think actually um, the, what you point out about toxic certainty is, um, is a brilliant way to think about the play and about this production. Um, I also really like what you said about Archidamus and Camillo, the first, that yeah. people just skip right over that. It is so weird. If you go yeah. back and look at the text, they're, they're basically <laughs> like uh, uncomfortable talking to each other. And then at the end, the one's like, well, when you come to visit Bohemia, we're going to drunk your drinks. We don't have anything else to do. We'll roofie you. It's weird. It's very weird. <laughs> and then the weirdness continues through, through the first scene. So most of the, I always watch to see how the productions usually struggle to excuse Leontes' sudden lack of faith in his wife. And I really liked what Quintessence did here. They have Leontes overhear and mishear what Hermione was saying. She was saying, we two queens will forgive you if you first sinned with us, and if you haven't sinned with anybody else except us since then. And Leontes heard just that part of it, and he seemed, I thought, to be hearing. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't notice that. I think that's what was going on. I don't know. Sitting over here, I'm like crying the whole play. <laughs> um, uh, but that's what I thought they that's were doing. Like he heard her say, "If you, Polixenes, sinned with 
the royal wheat with me and only with me, then it's okay. And then sort of set him off on that. Tripped, I think, was the word. Tripped. I mean, First tripped with us. Yeah, yeah, think about the very idea that fall. the idea that it was a fall. They tripped with the women. The women were ru ruined the friendship, essentially. Oh. And that is a, a disturbing way to think about a committed relationship. And not only that, he had to work so hard to get her to agree to marry him. Obviously, he had resentment about that. Um, so that's yeah. interesting. I'm sorry, go on. Oh, that's all right. The only other thing I wanted to add before we jump into general discussion is that the, the, the romances, we call them that. I mean, Shakespeare's company called them comedies. Um, but in this play, Shakespeare returns to that philia, that, that male-male friendship threatened by women, essentially. Um, two Gents, one of the earliest plays, as far as we can tell, I mean, we don't know the order in which they're written, but Two Gents obsesses over this question of, is the male-male friendship threatened by women um, actually, I, think, I feel like what Two Gents does, if you don't know this play, never mind, but it's, it's, <laughs> um, its point is look, audience, at how sick this principle is, and if you take it to its logical extreme, you've got one gentleman giving his fiance to the other gentleman as a sign of friendship at the end. Very upsetting. Um, that comes back to a question about nothing where Benedict um, essentially is forced to choose between his, his male camaraderie with Claudio and the prince or uh, Beatrice, and he, he chooses Beatrice. And so much ado seems to swerve toward marriage, away from male-male friendship. Two gents seems to take male-male friendships to an, an absurd conclusion. And this play seems to come back, I feel like Shakespeare compulsively comes back to that choice. And here, I guess the difference for me is that in the romance genre, one of the reasons I think we distinguish between comedy and romance, or want to, is that whereas in comedy, the women fix the shit that the men have screwed up, um, but then they fall silent or get conscripted into marriage at the end. In The Winter's Tale, um, Shakespeare seems to actually turn over government to women and say, well, the men can't quite seem to get this right, so let's let the women do it, which is um, interesting. I mean, it's a woman, Alina. Like, yeah. yeah. I, I agree with that. I, I also think the play is about what do you do with something unforgivable, right? His behavior was unforgivable, and yet Shakespeare wanted to contrive a happy ending. How do you do that? you create a magical ending. And um, I mean, it, it is, I, I think that, that in writing this play, Shakespeare was so aware, and there's so much of the sense in which the woman is the property of the man. I don't know if you noticed the language in the beginning, which clearly it runs through, as you said, the male-male friendship and the male-female, but the woman is always to some extent, unless she disguises as a man, uh, somehow um, objectify. But here, I think he was so aware of, again, I use the word toxic quality of that relationship to women, to treat them as objects. And that was the way in which Leontes thought. And in order to revise that, he had to go under the rule of Paulina and lose this woman and his son, who's never retrieved, right? He loses his son, so there's not a, a really full happy ending. There's loss that will never be retrieved, and, as well as the husband of Paulina, although that's substituted for with Pamela. But uh, not the son. <laughs> and I should also say that Polixenes is left without a mate. You know, everything is generally paired off uh, in the, at the end of comedies, but here you do have Polixenes <laughs> left as an odd man out. So what he ran out of character. Maybe right? they'll have a menage a trois, which would be the appropriate end. <laughs> because actually, the other thing I just wanted to say is, I've always felt it would be interesting to think that maybe, maybe um, there was an affair between the two. I mean, it's a nine month period. I mean, you're not, presumably not supposed to think that. But I think the point is, even if there were, his behavior was unforgivable. And I think that's the point. I wish that were more front and center. It would be very interesting to have a production that made it seem that it was possible that she could have had an affair with Polixenes. And what's so wrong with that? <laughs> I see your, do you, ha you think that? 
humanity. It's humanity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, this purity, this you know, the purity, the the certainty has to be broken down. Yeah. And and you just used the word weird. Um, uh, on opening night, uh, the director, who is also the artistic director of Quintessence, uh, called the play strange. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so again, I think you know, as we as we sort of think about whatever collective questions you have or responses that you have, uh, or for people who might be watching this um, uh, in digital format later, right? I think that's just like a I think that's a really healthy way to think about this piece, right? It is there are, there are so many things in it that are again we could call them odd or um, uh, where where again there's it's it is it is. I'm trying to come up with like the right summation of the sentence, but I just want to sort of create a freedom if people have questions or comments in terms of your responses. Like it's it's okay for us to sort of like question the the things that are happening within the in the context of the play. The, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So I have a question. Um, so I do know that in ancient um, Greece, for example, um, one thing I'm sometimes uh, when you mentioned about how uh, the muse is property. So in ancient Greece, to be a citizen of Greece you have to be able to prove that both the father and the mother were Greek citizens. And so because of that, women in Greece were um, kind of like, they had their own section of the house, they were watched, they were treated as property. And so that get, gets into the ancient Greco-Roman um, stories as well. Do you think that could have uh, had some sort of impact on uh, Shakespeare's view in this situation? Well, he, he does combine, obviously, Christian and classical mm -hmm. images in this play. Do um, you have thoughts on that? Yes, I just lost it, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I think, I, I, I think that this uh, sense of the woman as property is, is, is present in Elizabethan, in the Elizabethan period. So, you know, you see it in other Shakespeare plays as well. But I think it's being critiqued powerfully in this play. And that makes sense since Shakespeare is older and has evolved, so to speak, to a point where he can see around a lot of the uh, conventions that within which he operated. But uh, I mean, I think also he was certainly uh, aware of classical ideas. Uh, That's what it was, I was gonna say, yeah, yeah he's, um, He's always writing, setting things in other areas, but he's always writing about English people from the 16th and early 17th centuries. And so, I mean, he's got Bohemia with a sea coast. It does it. Seacoast. Yeah. Apollo in there as well. Yeah, that's right. But so, as you say, the mixing of pagan and and Christian values. I mean, so it's really a Christian play about this one and Lear about the awakening of faith, and. The, the possessed. I, I mean, I feel like there are, there are, there are two <laughs> two ways. There are many ways to read Shakespeare, but some of us are running around and saying, "Oh, he's a proto-feminist." You know, there's, <laughs> there, there's a there's a really easy and good and solid critique of that, and I feel like sometimes trying to talk with my students and trying to talk them into the notion that no, really, this is um, this is the, the whole point of comedy is that men don't know what they're doing. <laughs> and that women can fix it, and that we keep shutting them up at the end of the play. So this is this is breaking that mold. Well, yeah, um, and that's the like that's the taming of the shrew thing, yeah, right? Yeah. Where where it's you know throughout the whole thing there is this potential for what <coughs> we'd call it proto-feminism or some sort of subversion. But then the final monologue that Cave gives is uh, is 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 a challenge mm -hmm. in in terms of like thinking about any Absolutely. contemporary sense of gender. Um, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I think it's written throughout all the comedies. Yeah. Look at um, Much Ado About Nothing. Um, mm -hmm. Benedict is so afraid of women, and he's just rehearsing the kind of cultural party line, the, the cuckold jokes, um, the fear of female sexuality. I mean, but these, these two both lead to murder, right? 
It's funny though, I mean, when you think about um, Othello, you think about the Merchant of Venice, because that leads to murder. It doesn't actually lead to murder, but it could lead to murder. And um, what, it just made me think, I can't answer your question because I can't think of that, but I, I was thinking about how Othello and, and Shylock are both, you know, we understand why they behave the way they do. And it's almost as though with, with Leontes, Shakespeare's like short-circuiting it. He doesn't want to dwell on all that backstory and all that sort of realism. He just wants, and I do think that this, the, the discussion of the way those two boys were together as children is the backstory. But it's so, it's one speech and that's it. And you could, Luth, you could not catch it. But um, your point about other jealousies leading to murder, um, Oh, well, maybe in The Tempest, I suppose the brothers are, uh, what's his name, uh, the older brother, the oh, younger brother? Alonzo. Al yeah, Alonzo's, je I guess it's jealousy. Uh, he usurps and presumably kills Prospero, who survives on the island, but if there are other cases. Oh, uh, in As You Like It, um, um, Orlando and Oliver are brothers. Uh, Fernand, uh, the Duke Senior, and his brother, they try and kill each other, and then they're. They're both killing both the people, the fellow and the wives. They're killing wives. Oh, so you want to know wives yeah. in particular? Hmm. hmm. Are there other wives? That well, no, I was just gonna. I was just gonna sort of respond to that, right? Like, and again, I wonder if this is sort of impulse, right? If, you know. It is the is the notion that like Shakespeare sort of did the long form of this sort of yeah. the long form of he the tragic it, version of this yeah. before and so like what does this mean to like again I don't know if you use the word short change but that's sure. the thing yeah sure. short like to circuit. do to do yeah. the short circuit version that's the first three acts and so that then we can move on to I don't know what comes after in Act four and five right some of the whether it's a restoration or it's transformation it's the new generation it's a it's a it's a wonderful love in a way. I mean, it's simplistic in some ways and idealized, but there certainly is a sense of equality between Florizel and Perdita. Mm -hmm. And when, if you look at the speech that he makes about her, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, and um, like the waves of the sea, he says. She's like the waves of the sea. I, mean, I, I can't remember the exact language, but I do think it is an absolutely wonderful expression of mutual uh, admiration and love. And I, I can't think of any other case like that, maybe um, in The Tempest, but there it, it seems flatter to me. Yeah. Do you agree? Yeah. Well, and The Tempest comes after, right? Yeah. So then it's also like he's done this. He's done this. He's done yeah. this thing, so then moving on to the, the farewell to the Did trip. you have a question? I, I just thought comment? that Paulina was given a lot of power. Oh, screw. I mean, if we're talking about subservient women, boy, she wants a lot. Isn't she? Wasn't she yeah. great? She was well cast. Yeah, yeah. 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 Eleni is, is doing a fat yeah. work. It's, it's a really, it's, and it's a tough character, too. And that's what's so striking about this pr the play as it's written and as it's always performed is that, is that Leontes just says, well, I screwed it up. I'm listening to you. You tell me what to do. You give me permission. You are in charge. Yeah. It's great. She describes herself as his counselor and his physician. And sometimes that's not taken literally, and sometimes it is. But is she a physician? Uh, is she a magician? <laughs> well, and that's the other that's the other big thing where it's like the the it's so it's so interesting because we have this magical moment at the end, right? But you know, the occult and witchcraft and, um, again I don't know if either of you want to sort of respond to that, but like very, very different for uh, Shakespeare's audience than for our audience, right? So, like, throughout all of those references, right? Uh, the reason why the bear is there, right? And it, again, is it is it more supernatural than um, Rosalind? And as you like it, is like, look, y'all, I'm not getting into the magic because that would make you be a witch, and that would be bad. <laughs> and yeah. Paulina has a very similar point to me. Yeah. She's like, if you don't like what I'm doing, then get out. Yeah. And Leon yeah. says, no, 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 no. <laughs> Whatever you do is now legal. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, there's the witchcraft is a, a powerful woman. That's a problem for 
relative, generally speaking, for early modern culture. So yeah. you, it's, a, it's a powers associated with the occult, bad things. And it's, that, that reads more clearly, I feel like, in other plays from the period. But I'd just love to hear some observations about the production from people out there. Yeah. I thought it was interesting that um, Antigone was one of the loyal servants. He tried to stand up for you know, what was right. He even deceived all of his children if he was wrong, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then he's the one that gets killed by the bear for doing exactly what the king wanted him to do. But then Camillo, who's the honest man, is the one that says he'll do it, but then goes and helps Philoctetes and saves him. So, and he's alive at the end, and he's sort of redeemed. I just thought it was interesting. The honest man is the one that disobeys the king's command. And the one you that- You have to know when to disobey. Right, blind loyalty is not um, rewarded. I think that's really, that's revolutionary, right? But also though, you know, I was struck because I hadn't, I guess I hadn't fully registered it, that when he, when Antigonus has the dream, no, when he, yeah, the dream makes him go to Bohemia but that, uh, he, he, it convinces him that in fact she was guilty. Right. Did you catch that? Yeah. But yeah. she might have been, and he's like, I think. I think that she's guilty because she seems to want the baby to go to where the, to the father is. So that adds a little, <laughs> a little spice to that. Okay. <laughs> um, at the very end, I can't get over it. That her, her deducts, I always say, had the, picked up the teddy bear, the teddy bear of her brother, who she, whom she never met. Uh -huh. But there was a terribly sad moment while everybody's cheering and it's over. Yeah. Well, what in the world was that? And that is, that is a directorial choice. Yes. Yeah. Very interesting. Uh, and I'd love to hear if people have thoughts on what that choice means. Yeah. Does that relate to the bear that consumes the... <laughs> oh. yeah, good point. I never thought of that. I saw the ending looked strange. Very strange. Because she looked puzzled. Yeah, do, yeah, do you have... Um, she was puzzled. Yeah. Yeah, so I interpret it as that it's still... I may be called a comedy, but it's still a tragedy. There's still this tragic note. But Leontes was... He can't fix his mistake. There's mm. nothing he can do. And so that like that now he has to explain this to his daughter. And the way they stage the two yeah. uh, um, Perdita and Florizel almost as though separated. Okay. And he had a look, a quizzical look on his face, as though now this is a division somehow between them. So there was, in the play itself, it looks like they have a perfect union. But the director must have chosen to break that a little bit, which I think was a really interesting choice. I feel like more often than not, I've seen this staging at the end separate the women from the men on purpose to unsettle that sense of closure. And yeah. I thought this one was going boldly into traditional closure and then the teddy bear. <laughs> the teddy bear. That was a very, yeah, there was a note at the end of the play there. Yeah. In other productions, did they use a child's toy of some kind? To I've never seen remember that. Remember the dead okay. brother's son? I've never even seen him referenced him. I mean, that's a, I mean, and yeah, I've only seen this play 30 times. How old is Amelia supposed to be? 10, 12? Six. <laughs> Six, I think, or seven? That really? That young? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Reaching age. He's, he's got to be uh, like and seven. Yeah, we, we, have, um, we have two different uh, Mamelia citizens. Oh. Um, and so one of them is doing uh, mainly the public performances, and then we have, uh, he's, he's a little older, um, but uh, we have a very, very young uh, Amelius that's doing a lot of the student matinees. And so even, and even in sort of registering the age, right, it's so, it's so interesting to think about like the differences and how that, how that really tragic moment, when we sort of have that response of, uh, you know, the server coming on and saying, did you have something? Oh, I was going to say about um, the ending and the bear and the separation. Mm. To me, it was almost a hint of that history may can repeat itself. It mm. may repeat itself. There might be a problem their between their relationship. Them. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. what I thought too. Uh, between the young couple. Between the young, the young couple. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Potentially, right? Like, and, and that 
again, is that an open question of like, you know, we, we, we go to these plays because uh, maybe we want to leave with a solved ending. Yeah. <laughs> right? There's something, there's comfort in that. Definitely. And so like, what is that, what is that impulse to unsettle, um, mm. especially what Shakespeare's audiences would have, like, again, you know, you, you want, well, and even the tragedies would end in a dance, right? Is that? Or <coughs> Virgo mask at the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. yeah. speculation. I don't think we right. Okay, we don't know. But Mamilius, you know, one of the problems with a young child is he's supposed to be so precocious. I don't know if you caught the interchange with the ladies. And he's, fl yeah. he's flirtatious. You know, talk about her eyebrows and all of that. And, and there's something precocious and maybe a little weird about him. Like, he's, he's got... He's uh, creepy. Yeah. Where is his name? Yeah, Mamilius suggests the link to the mother. But the, hmm. the repartee with the ladies makes him seem maybe he is unduly advanced because of things he's seen in the household. What is that? Well, Leontes is 30, and he says, looking on the lines of my boy's face, I, I, I backed myself up 23 years, which puts Amelius around seven. And there are these references to breaching, which is something you know, kids don't get gendered until a certain age. So I, I feel like, I, I can't remember exactly the Leontes age part, but I'm pretty sure Amelius is about seven. Hmm. If, if we want the text to be the guide, and, right. I mean, that may or may not But he be. likes to have precocious, I mean, Shakespeare yeah. likes to have precocious children. And they never, like, ever what is it, end Richard well. Richard III. They don't know. Well. Right. Yeah. So young and so wise and yeah. never long. <laughs> yeah. That line that the, um, the ladies were talking about, um, uh, what was it, were they like, if we let you, like, uh, what they could, uh, I forget the next line. We were talking, like, when he was admiring them, they were talking about how like what they could like do to him yeah. if they let if you know if they let him. That was very suggestive. Mm -hmm. At the same time, children were very had a different world than yeah, our protected that's true. children. They saw everything. Yeah. It's a whole different world. It wasn't a protected idea children. of childhood. Now yeah. it's you know, they can't see anything ever. Until they're forty four. That's you. <laughs> The child gives the play its name at the winter's sale, so yeah. it's like you have to hold this kid in your head for a long time to watch it. Definitely. Yeah. Yes. How did Shakespeare know so much about hillbillies? <laughs> <laughs> sort of uh, responses in terms of that, again, another very strong directorial choice. Um, uh, uh, and again, I think it, for me personally, it sort of goes back to like, what do we do with Shakespeare's clowns, right? There is so much context that would just, and again, the other uh, play that we're doing, uh, so this is the transformation repertory. We're doing this in, uh, in, um, in rotating rep with Ben Johnson's The Alchemist. And so, again, there is sort of this notion of like, you know, so what choices do actors have to make when the context, which would have been more apparent, the jokes, the actual reason for the jokes would have, like, you have to, like, what do you do with that? How do, how do we address that so that it is, the funny moments are still funny, even though we might not know what some of those specific words mean. Well, I think they make, you make it very physical. And, uh, some people like that and some people don't. I know my husband doesn't like that that business because it's he, right. Until <laughs> 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 then, we had no idea who you were. Married to Polonia. <laughs> what did you say? Married to Polonia. <laughs> What did you think of the of the tour? Ooh, sorry, some. Yeah. Yeah. What did, did I, I loved it. I thought that was uh, just refreshing. I didn't expect it. Um, it seemed to work really well. Um, I suspected that there were something like the Billies back in the day. Uh, you know, clowns, but like rustics. Are like rustics. Shepherd, well, shepherds. Yeah. You know, I guess the shepherd is you know, something like the, the stereotype is a lot older than the twenty. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
Is that the way it's normally done, or is there other ways to play yeah, that? I think it's normally think done. Not, yeah. With different, um, different variations of the same yeah. that you saw, very broadly done. And they're funny. It's supposed to be really broadly done. I feel like funny. the energy really comes up, um, and the, the cast were fantastic at that, I thought. You're, yeah. Bringing the, bringing the comedy in, like you really, you just watch the most depressing, it's like the first, <laughs> oh my, it's terrible, right? It's, it reminds me of Mad Max Fury Road, it's just like an onslaught, it's just <laughs> terrible awfulness. And then you get that, I don't know. Shepherd, yeah. yeah. I like it when they say Antigonus as actually drawing the bear away from the child. Hmm. Which is not possible here, but I really like, I like the bear, the bear was great. Yeah, the bear was wonderful. Really and this was good, I thought. Too. I yeah. mean, again, you can't understand a lot of what he's saying, but I thought he did a good job giving the sense that he was a con artist of the first order. And that was a nice, it's a nice motif. And he was well cast, I thought. Yeah. Plus he plays guitar. <laughs> that was nice. Yeah. So what did other people like, particularly, or maybe not like? This is why I say the play is deliberately awful for that actor. Like by design, because you, you played the role. The you played the role in college. I don't have proper acting training, so I, yeah. a person like me couldn't be expected to do that well. But I feel like that is the problem. You get a good actor, and the lines will bring the actor to ten immediately, as you saw. Mm. It's really hard not to get to ten, and so I've always suspected that these late plays, written for a different theatrical space, at least, arguably. Um, must have done something with the styliza stylization, a different sort of acting that, I mean, there's no way to get through all of those lines without half the cast is just crying the whole time and then they have a screaming. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it certainly isn't, isn't easy to watch, so I've always thought maybe there, there was some experimental delivery or something. I mean, the lines, the, the enjambment, the way that the verse is built is really weird. It's a trap. As if Shakespeare had a real problem with Burbage and was going to really torture him with the play. But the hardest thing he could possibly <laughs> yeah. come up with that, it's I think really that's difficult. a fabulous theory. The <laughs> actor that he knew would play this role. It's an irresponsible yeah. theory, but I'm sticking with <laughs> <laughs> Any criers out there? Am I the only one over here crying? You were crying? Oh my god. There, there, were, oh. there were a couple of yeah. during the yeah. like I, I was tearing up a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, the statue coming it. to life was like, very moving. Before that, Oh, for on, uh, you mean for Hermione's sake, you were crying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Do you think the statue that came to life is the true, like, full uh, queen, or is she one that is sort of like a version that's able to cope with having lost a child? Because she didn't mention anything about the son that she lost. She seems oh, just to be this perfect version that's able to be the queen. Again. So, what's the question? It, is she the same as the one that died, or is she like another version that's there to replace the thing? Well, they say that she has wrinkles, right? <laughs> and she says, I preserved myself so, for 16 years. Yes. But I really like what Paula said at the beginning, that, that certainty is the problem. <laughs> yeah. like, really, You're trying like, to get us to tell like, you. Like, <laughs> 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 you can't. It's, it's great. Impossible. It's ambiguous. And, yeah. and, and the line that comes out that. that's come out to my ear, having watched it a couple of times, is, is Paulina's line about faith, yeah. right? We just have to trust, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever that is. Um, the other, again, the other thing that I've read um, is that uh, because Shakespeare would have been familiar with classical models. Um, there is a Euripides play called Alcestis um, that's about a king who, rather than dying himself, uh, his wife takes his place and goes to Hades. And then he sends 
Um, I think it's Hercules. Hercules. Um, yeah, he sends Hercules to Hades to bring the wife back, but the wife cannot speak once the wife is back. And again, the, the, the thing that I've read in some scholarship is that's what this moment is, is ghosting a little bit. Yes, is, yes. That, is that story. I don't know if that's she true. Never, she never speaks to um, Leontes, if you notice that. She only speaks to her daughter. Yeah. So again, it, it and that's like real, like from the Greek perspective, like that's really like something really magical, right? Like some sort of shade mm -hmm. that's back from Hades. Again, it is the indeterminacy that in the Winter's Tale that is is very very different. Where it's like we don't we don't know what the extent. Yeah. It's also interesting that they name a, 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 a Shakespeare names a, a Elizabethan, I believe, a sculptor as mm. the person, I can't remember the name. Of, Juliana Romano. Yeah. yeah, Romano. Is that right? Yeah. Who did this, the sculpture, which is an interesting, you know, insertion of something contemporary into the play, obviously meant to uh, rouse us. Um, but also the art nature dichotomy always at work in Shakespeare. And he's so, I think, you know, what was it that I was thinking about the other day with that? Um, the, the, the Hamlet and the players, for example, if I was just reading Hamlet with a group of people, and the idea that art, or you know, in the case of art for Shakespeare, it's the play, is both penetrates life and is apart from life, and that that dichotomy is constantly, I think, at work with him. How much does art affect life? How much is it a detachment from life? You know, and I think that he's maybe playing around with that with the statue. If, um, if the king and Hermione at the end, at, at the, well, she doesn't speak to him, but she does hug him and kiss him, I guess, didn't she? Yeah. yeah. Well, do they go off being happily married again, or what, you know? You tell me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, right? I can't be. <laughs> <laughs> well, like what happens when they're not in a public place, yeah. right? Like what? Does her mind be dropped? Yeah. She kills him. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. What was I was going to say about the, um, the Escalades play is that Hercules actually makes the king marry, remarry his dead wife. Oh, yeah. Um, so when we had the, um, the advisor say, I'm going to decide who you marry. I kind of thought we were going in that direction too, um, like before. Yeah, again, it's not a. It's like the the Greek story is not. It's not like lined up. I mean, Shakespeare was also uh, with the sources was also very liberal in in many many right. Yeah, whereas like whatever source text he was using, he was always putting his own stamp and and choices on it. But um, but yeah, that's one of the things that. Uh, I think we're probably no more or less unsettled. There's a, I feel like my students are always saying, well, back then, women didn't matter, so nobody would have cared about it. Like, I don't think that's, it doesn't make sense to me. Hmm. There must be some kind of, this is a more irresponsible speculation, but there must be some kind of <laughs> continuity in the way these plays came to affect their early audiences with how they affect them now. Hmm. I mean, the earliest records we have of, of pr productions of Othello, people writing diary entries about how moving it was, how upset they were on behalf of Desdemona. The earliest records we have of two gentlemen of Verona getting performed, they're rewriting it because they can't stand the things that the people do. I feel like there's gotta be some, some bulk of what we're watching in this place that had the same effect on early audiences. And so if we're uncomfortable with the notion that Leontes and Hermione are gonna go off and live happily ever after, we're not just uncomfortable because we're in the 21st century. I feel like it's, it's in the play to start with. I agree with you. My students uh, like, like to have suggested that Hermione and Paulina have a had a relationship for 16 years. Hmm. And now, because the daughter has come back, she's going to reassert herself into the uh, huh. heterosexual relationship. So. Uh, the makeup Well, this, all, the audience for this, was this, where was this performed? This would have been at the Blackfriars. Right, yeah. because the, I mean, what the, and it's actually interesting with the two plays we're doing in rap, right? They both, uh, this one is 1610, and then Alchemist is 1611. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Um, and so, again, I think that's one of the interesting things about these two plays in conversation with each other. There would have been the plague, that another outbreak of the plague that would have shut down. And so Shakespeare and Johnson would have gone off to write these two separate plays. And then they would have been part of that, that reopening. Again, a little different than our reopening because yeah. the plague was continued right and there were multiple wow. times it would have shut down. Yeah. But yeah. The question I had me was was that the audience, I mean our our audiences are about fifty percent male and even female, but I think so. Yeah. Uh, I think it was uh, male and female, and it was more of class difference than yeah. probably you would have at a play here, mm -hmm. a Shakespeare yeah. play now. Yeah. And you know, you had you had people who really were totally uneducated, and you had the aristocracy coming, and so I think also the the clowns and so forth were for the um, the populace, <laughs> and I think Shakespeare had an understanding of class difference that maybe other plays like playwrights like Ben Jonson didn't have. Mm -hmm. So um, that gave him a wider appeal. Or maybe the clowns are there for the Blackfriars audience to laugh at. Yeah. <laughs> but so this would have played at the Blackfriars, which would have had a high, more yeah. well healed audience. But well, that's yeah. the, the, the indoor. Right? Yeah. 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 Right. So as opposed to the Globe, which is sort of the outdoor, sort of O-shaped one. So the Bradleys would be exposed down, right? to the elements. Um, the although at this point it had been rebuilt, and these plays presumably would have played both spaces. Huh. Blackfriars, indoors, for bad weather, um, <laughs> play private, uh, bespoke performances, but the, the same plays would have hit the public stage as well, as far as we know. I could be wrong about that. I haven't looked at that stuff in decades. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, the audience, I, I feel like there would be probably more Boys had more freedom, so you'd have apprentices, etc. Um, there were plays in which apprentices go to the theater, and it's a sort of, and that's depicted on part of the stage. But there were women in the theater, yeah. yeah. Uh, all right, so this would be yeah, our last, our last. Yeah. Person. I, I was going to ask, I should have researched this, but what's with the title? Like, is it like half of it in the spring, and then there's the Harvard Festival, and is the winter, is the winter a metaphor, as opposed to any kind of time period of <laughs> play? Well, what is the reference to the winter? It tells, what does he say? Uh, he says, right? of sad tales best for winter. winter. Well, yeah, I, I think that's it. There's the shearing festival at the, in the second <coughs> half, right? Which is, I guess, spring. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that we didn't talk about it, but the uh, discussion of the flowers, which is so interesting, because they're, when they have the discussion <laughs> about the flowers, uh, Perdita and, uh, what's his name, uh, Polixenes are actually taking opposite positions from their actual position. She's saying, I won't have a flower in my garden that's grafted. And he's saying, you should, that's part of nature to graft two types onto each other, which is intermarriage, right? But then he turns on it, but I don't think it's really because he's against the lower class woman, but he, that his son kept him, kept this away from him, although, Represented as both. I'm just yeah. thinking this right now, and I don't know. I don't, again, it's speculation. I don't know. But, like, I wonder if there is something in, like, sort of the, like the change of the seasons, right? Again, we do have that 16, 17 year gap that happens. But, like, to sort of think about, like, you know, starting the play in sort of a fall, moving to winter, getting to spring for the, the, the fourth act. And then, again, is there some sort of summer that happens? and sort of like that rotation of the seasons maybe. But again, that would just be my reading and, and more based on the production than Shakespeare intending that. Is there a frozen quality to that jealousy? Hmm. Mm. Sure. Yeah. And we can leave I that like in that. winter, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Some jealousy. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, okay, thank you. Thank you all for thank you all for coming. Um, uh, I do want to you know we're going to continue doing these post show discussions. Um, we also have our adult classes. Um, the director of uh, the Ben Johnson's The Alchemist is actually going to lead a Shakespeare uh, rhetoric soliloquy class that's four weeks. So if you're interested, you can come uh, reach out to me or you can find it on our website. It's uh, not tomorrow, but the following four Mondays in the evening. If you're interested, he's a, he's a wonderful actor and a really, really good director. Um, so thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.